Well, my name is Randy. I'm one of the pastors here. If you are new, um, Pastor Paul, our lead pastor, is um, away on vacation, but he'll be back next week um, to continue in the series um, together. Why do we come together? Um, why do we do the things that we do um, as a church family? But today is a little bit of a, okay, this message is I'm going to show that it, it has some connection to that, but officially it's a standalone sermon, um, not quite connected with that series. Um, I want to begin by talking about letters. Um, in this day and age, we have lost the art, or some of, I know I have, lost the art of uh, writing letters. Uh, I have a question. In the last, say, six months, how many of you actually have gotten out a pen, penned a letter, put an envelope, put the address, and put a stamp and send it in the mail? It's more than I thought, so you guys are doing good. Letter writing is great. There's all kinds of different letters. There's letters of inquiry, uh, letters of appreciation, a thank you. There's love letters. There's uh, Dear John letters. How many of you gotten a Dear, Dear, Dear John letter? Anybody? You guys know what that means? Dear John is like a breakup letter. Um, if you're a farmer, you get a John Deere letter. Okay. Okay. Where's my drummer? Okay. Uh, I want to um, share with you a famous letter that I came across because they're humorous letters. I like this one. It's from Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was always uh, prepared to joke about himself, especially when it came to his appearance. Um, by the standards of the day, he was indeed considered quite ungainly. He wrote to um, a friend. One day, I got into a fit of musing in my room and stood resting my elbows on the bureau. Looking into the glass, it struck me what an ugly man I was. The fact grew on me, and I made up my mind that I must be the ugliest man in the world. It so maddened me that I resolved, should I ever see an uglier, I would shoot him on sight. Not long after this, Andy, naming a lawyer present, came to town, and the first time I saw him, I said to myself, there's the man. I went home and took down my gun, prowled around the streets waiting for him. He soon came along. Halt, Andy, said I, pointing the gun at him. Say your prayers, for I am going to shoot you. Why, Mr. Lincoln, what's the matter? What have I done? Well, I made an oath that if I ever saw an uglier man than I am, I'd shoot him on the spot. You are uglier, surely, so make ready to die. Mr. Lincoln, do you really think that I am uglier than you? Yes. Well, Mr. Lincoln, said Andy, deliberately and looking me squarely in the face, if I am any uglier, fire away. <laughs> I mentioned love letters. Do you know that the entire um, Bible is a love, love letter from your creator God, your Lord and Savior, um, Jesus Christ, the, this love letter from God to you all throughout explaining um, how much he loves you. Ultimately, that he came and he conquered death and said, oh, death, where is your sting? And he died for us that you might have eternal life, that if you accept Jesus into your heart and say, Jesus, I accept the payment that you made for my sins. I am a sinner, and you died so that I might have eternal life. I want you to be Lord and Savior in my life. Because of that miracle, you can have eternal life. That's basically the love letter. And then there's many other letters with, uh, within this letter. There's um, letters that Paul wrote to the different churches. Um, we're going to focus starting on uh, one letter that we find in the book of Revelation. So if you want to turn your Bible to the book of Revelation, let me make that clear. Uh, a lot of people mispronounce that book and say Revelations. It's actually, if you look at verse 1 of chapter 1, it says this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so there's a little, uh, little lesson there for you all today, for us all. Um, so this was the revealing, this was the revealing of Jesus Christ to John. John was the disciple who Jesus loved, and he was very old, and he was su suffering in tribulation on the island of Patmos, which is in Greece, and he was um, exiled there. And, um, but something good came out of it because he was there and God was able to meet him. He was a captive audience. Um, God sent an angel um, to speak to him and to reveal many things which were to come. 
It says, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, per- Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, and Crossroads Christian Fellowship, and Bethany Lutheran, and the Little Brown Church, and the list goes on and on. Because you see, this letter was not for just for this church church, these seven churches. This letter was for all of the church today, and each letter that was written to each church has a message for our church in it today. And you know what else? It has a message for Randy. Um, It has a a message for Lydia. Um, It has a a message for Paul, for uh, for Robin, um, for, for everybody. Each one of these letters, if we look at it closely, God is speaking to us. We're going to focus in on one of the letters today. And this letter is the second letter found in chapter 2, verse 8 through 11. And I'm going to read this. It's a short letter. And it's a letter to the church of Smyrna. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, The first and the last, who is dead and has come to life, says this, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Smyrna was known and is still known today as the suffering church. We can learn so much, and we are going to learn a little bit today about their suffering and what it means to us and, and kind of what's happening um, as we explore this mystery of suffering because it truly is a mystery. Sometimes we're going through things, we, um, we, we get beat up, and, and uh, we don't understand why we're going through what we're going through. We, we we can't see. Sometimes the enemy is invisible. Things are coming at us, and sometimes they come in waves. It's like, I give up. Come on. Really, so much is happening, and I don't know where it's coming. It's like the fighter who, um, in between rounds, uh, uh, the uh, trainer in the corner says to him, hey, champ, you're doing great. He ain't, he ain't laid a glove on you. Keep going, and the champ says, I don't know, you better keep an eye on that referee because somebody out there is beating the daylights out of me. And that's how I think we feel. We're, we're getting beat up, we're, we're torn down, and we don't know where it's coming from. And often we look to God and we say, what's the purpose? What is the purpose in this suffering? It is a mystery. So today, I guess the two key verses for today as you look at the I'll mention the, the cover of your bulletin in a second. But James 1, 2, and 4, these two verses, it's kind of a hard pill to swallow. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let pers- for perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Consider it pure joy. Next, 1 Peter 3, 14. But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. So the title of my message today is a little bit snarky towards God. It's uh, uh, pure joy, blessings, really? Because if you're honest, I'm, I'll be honest, sometimes that, as I mentioned, is a hard pill to swallow. We think, God, I'm not there. I'm not feeling the joy, and I'm not feeling the blessing. I'm feeling the pain. That's what I'm feeling. I'm feeling the discouragement. I feel like the fighter that's beat up, and I don't know where the enemy is and why this is happening to me. But we're hopefully going to be encouraged today. Um, we don't have all the answers but hopefully a little bit of the mystery will be revealed in some of what I share today. I said it's a mystery. I think it was last week or a couple weeks ago, Pastor Paul mentioned about um, communion and um, also baptism, that within 
those two things, um, ordinances, there is a great mystery. There is a mystery that when we are obedient to God in those things, because uh, the book of John tells us that the number one way that we can show our love to God is through obedience. And we, when we're obedient to those ordinances, baptism and communion, God shows up in a real mysterious way. And I think that the same is true with suffering and tribulation. We don't have all the answers, but in this mysterious way, God meets us in the middle of our suffering. You know, um, in the uh, letter it's to Smyrna, it says, I am aware of your tribulation. I'm aware of your suffering. That's encouraging because we know that the The king of the universe, the God who is in control of all things, is aware. He is not blinded. He is not taken by surprise. Uh, He saw it coming when he created you. He knew that you were going to go through it. Um, And he knew that he'd be there with you. And and hopefully we will see the purpose in it. I love this saying. uh, It's one of my favorite quotes. Has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God. Let me say that again. Has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? In other words, um, you know, God's not like, oh, wow, I didn't see that coming. Wow. You know, or, you know, oops, oops. Um, No, it says in Smyrna, it says, I am aware of your tribulation. God is fully aware of what you're going through, your suffering. I believe that we, we, we as Christians, um, as I mentioned, um, eternal life is offered to us from Jesus, from our Heavenly Father. If we just take it and say, Lord, I'm a sinner, um, you, I, I recognize that you had to pay the price for my sin when you died on the cross, when you endured the darkest of nights, and the sky lit up, and a miracle was born. And I accept that. When we sign up for that, I think that God takes us through a honeymoon stage in our life. Um, for a new believer, there's this time everything is roses. Everything is rainbows and, and sunshine and, and God's speaking to you. And everything is falling into line. It's just so easy. But then as you mature, I'd call that the milk. God says, I want to take you to the next level of usefulness for me because you're just a child. You're just a baby. And I'm going to give you some meat. And sometimes that meat is actually circumstances. And the circumstances can be tough, and they can be put in our lives to cause us to grow, to cause us to repent, cause us to um, submit. But it's hard, because when we sign up for being a child of God, we get the rose, but we also get the thorn. You know the song, every, every, uh, every rose ha- has its thorn, every cowboy sings a sad, sad song. I think it's true with Christianity, too. It's, it's not all sunshine. There's going to be those days that are darker. And God says, endure. I'm with you. I, I see it. And there, there, sometimes you're going to see the great purpose that is in your suffering. If you are a relatively new Christian, or, or maybe actually for all of us, um, I should say this for everyone. I pray that the trials and the suffering that come into our lives do not become a stumbling block that don't cause you to question your faith to question who God is to question your savior's heart but hopefully the exact opposite will happen that through it as you see God working and doing the things mysteriously that he does in our lives when we go through suffering that it will make you stronger One thing I've noticed in life, I get to, in working in the church and over the, the last, um, you know, 27 years being in ministry here, I've worked with a number of uh, pastors, ministry leaders, and saints, um, staff members, and um, I remember w- a number of years ago looking around the table at our staff and something had caught my attention, and I thought about how um, each of them had signed up to a full life of ministry and then I also recognized the unique suffering that each of them had endured that's probably um, could be greater than um, the average person on the street. I think of Pastor Hal. We had his uh, um, 
Celebration of Life Service. He was the pastor here, Hal Curtis, from um, 2002 um, until 2012. And during his life committed to serving God, uh, he endured a lot. His wife, Pauline, came very close to death. Their son, David, at, their first child at age five, um, died unexpectedly. Um, their, fi- their house burned down two different times. Um, it, the list goes on and on. And so one pattern I've seen with the saints that I've encountered in life is the saints will suffer. So just know what we sign up for. It reminds me of the courage of a woman who signs up to start a family. It's talking to Megan Erickson. Where are you, Megan? How you doing? How many weeks left? Four weeks. And she's going to give birth. And I asked her how she's feeling. She's like, and she didn't even know what I was talking to her. She's like, I am suffering. <laughs> and and uh, I said, okay, I might use that. Because um, I actually had in my note talking about the courage of a woman who has agreed to start a family. Here's what she's agreeing to. She's agreeing, when she's agreeing to get pregnant and to have God grow this child inside of her. And then when the hour comes, when the time comes, um, from what I understand, not been there, but I've heard a lot that it's just a little bit painful. A lot more than a little bit. And a woman goes into that ahead of time knowing, eyes wide open with courage, that the pain that she's going to have to face, that's courageous. You know why she does it? There's a verse, Psalm 30, verse 5, weeping may endure for the night, but the joy comes in the morning. I've heard so many times the stories of the ladies who have looked into their child's eyes and said, uh, the affliction is eclipsed by glory. The, the pain, I, I don't remember it anymore because of this child that God has given me. The same thing can be true with God, what God wants to birth in us when we sign up for obedience, when we sign up for potential suffering. God says, if you just endure Just watch what I'm going to birth because of what you're going through. Sometimes we get to see it, and sometimes we don't. But we have to trust God that he is in control. And he says, I know you're suffering. Mature Christians understand when it comes to suffering that, and this is probably the heart of my message today, the great opportunities that come from suffering. I, th- I was trying to think the perfect word or the perfect illustration for this idea that when suffering comes, it's like a trump card. Have you ever played, um, I don't know, uh, w- I played a, a card game called uh, uh, Rook growing up, and you had trump. There's other card games where you have a trump card that kind of beats everything. It, it catapults the power. Um, you think of a catapult. You think of a leverage A leverage is a tool that helps you do what you normally wouldn't be able to do. I have to think that suffering can be a leverage. It allows you to do things that the average person, for God's glory, would not be able to do because of the suffering. So oftentimes, as I said before, we see the purpose in it, and sometimes we won't see it, but it'll be there. Um... When, when the, the skies light up and we're, we're with Jesus, he'll, it, it will all make sense. The city of Smyrna, interesting enough, um, the name of that city, it's, as we mentioned, it's the city, uh, the suffering city. Um, that word Smyrna, the root of that city's name is the word myrrh. And we know that the, the gifts that the wise men brought were um, if you didn't know, they were prophetic. The gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. And the gold was a prophetic uh, gift saying that he was going to be a, this baby, this Jesus was going to be a king, royalty. The frankincense um, 
tells us in Hebrews that Jesus was our final high priest, that we would no longer have to go to a man um, to intercede for us. We had direct access. The veil was torn. We had direct access to God because Jesus is our final high priest. The incense or the uh, frankincense was a incense that the priests used um, and that they used to burn. And so that was a prophetic gift about Jesus being our high priest. Thirdly, the myrrh was a prophetic gift saying that, that Jesus would be our suffering Savior, our suffering Messiah. You see, myrrh is, if you didn't know, it's like a little bulb. Um, and myrrh was, A, um, it was a prophetic gift that Jesus would die. He would suffer and die because myrrh was used to embalm the dead. Also interesting enough about myrrh, it's prophetic about who Jesus was and what he's teaching us in this message today, is that myrrh was a bulb that could only release its beautiful aroma after it was crushed. Jesus was crushed for us. And when he was crushed, that beautiful aroma uh, penetrated um, the darkest night in history. And the skies lit up. So as you know, this suffering church, and we uh, have a message in there that this uh, suffering church endured, and God is trying to say, us, hang, say to us, hang in there. Um, you will be t there will be times when you will need to be crushed for the aroma to um, penetrate the darkness that is around you. Um, there's going to be suffering, and it feels like you're being crushed, but there's a purpose for it. The first one in your outline, the fill in the blank is the crushing actually produces the beautiful aroma. We've, all we, we've already talked about the, that picture of Christ and, and, and the prophetic gift. I, th I believe that sometimes God uses suffering to get our attention. He wants us to uh, submit to him. There, there are different reasons. Sometimes there's just plain sin. There's sin of others and you are the fallout. Um, um, of other people's sin because they're disobedient and they're they are um, so far from God and because you might be in a situation where you are close to them maybe it's a relative or a friend um, and you suffer because of their sin and their disobedience to God and their dark heart um, and that's unfortunate but sometimes sin I mean, uh, suffering is due because we have a lack of submission, a lack of obedience and trusting of God. It reminds me of um, um, a cowboy and a wild horse. God gave me this little slogan for today um, related to that. I think of a, a horse that is wild, and when it's been tamed um, by the cowboy, it's now useful to the cowboy, and that cowboy would tell his friends, uh, can we ride that horse? And they, they say, he'd say, yes, because that horse is broke. Broke, but not broken is a big difference. Um, that cowboy has climbed on top of that horse, and that horse um, was wild, and it kicked and bucked and jumped and ran and bucked and bucked that cowboy off. Next day, cowboy came back. Okay, let's try this again. And that cowboy just kept coming back until that horse was broke. And the ob obvious metaphor is we are that horse and God is the cowboy. And sometimes God keeps coming back and keeps coming back. But there will eventually be a time where God will say, this is the last time. I'm getting on your back. And if you don't submit and become useful to me, I'm going to leave you for a season to your own devices. I was talking to Ronnie Pierce this morning. He told me a story um, about, because uh, we were talking a little bit about the message, and he said that um, when, as a young man, God called him into ministry. Um, he, he, Ronnie Pierce, if you don't know him, he's uh, called him the Bishop of Big Fork. He pastored Little Brown Church and S Swan Chapel, and, or he was youth pastor at Little Brown Church. And, and he, uh, God called him into ministry and kept coming back, three years coming back, coming back, you know, getting the spurs into him a little bit. I want you to go into full-time ministry. And Ronnie admitted he had this false humility. Oh, that's not me. I could never be good enough for that. Finally, God came one more time, Ronnie said, and said, this is the last time I'm going to ask you. I will never ask again. I want you to serve in ministry full-time as a pastor. And finally, Ronnie trusted the cowboy. He learned that it was a lot easier to submit 
and trust than to do all that bucking and jumping and running and kicking. And that's such a good picture of sometimes who we are and we're stubborn. God keeps coming back. And, and if we just get to that point where we say, okay, God, I give up. I repent and I submit. Here I am. Use me. Or in Scripture it says, send me. That's where God wants to take you. And that's another purpose for sometimes when, when we think it's suffering. No, no. It's just God on our back trying to get us to obey and trust him and submit to him. And it feels painful. It's only painful because you're kicking and jumping and running and screaming and and bucking and all of that. So I want to talk, finish with this, a story of the Gideon. You you all probably know the story in in Judges. God had uh, saw something in Gideon and and he wanted Gideon to raise up a, an army against uh, a very, very large army of the, of the uh, Midianites. And um, an angel of the Lord in Judges six twelve said, When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And Gideon's like, Who are you talking to? Who? <laughs> That's not me. And he told him again. And... Uh, Gideon finally submitted, and he was just a humble farmer. He was actually kind of hiding out in the wine press, hiding some food from the enemy. And he said, okay, um, if you're in this, I'm in this. And he sent out a memo, we need a big army. 32,000 men showed up, and God said, that's too many. And God said, just tell them if they're scared, they can go home. So he did. Uh, 22,000 men left. (laughs) They were scared. He was left with 10,000. And God said, still too many. Um, Tell them to get a drink of water out of the stream. 9,700 of them went down on their face and drank with their face in the water. And only 300 drank like this, eyes open, fully aware. God said, those are my 300 men. That's all you get against an army of uh, thousands and thousands and thousands. All that they were armed with was a trumpet, a clay pot, and a torch in the clay pot. And they went and they sounded the trumpet. They were all spread out around the enemy. They sounded the trumpet. And at the same time, they broke the clay pot. I want to read something for you real quick. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. I forgot to fill in the blank before. Broke does not have to mean broken for the second one. The third one is the treasure in the earthen vessel is actually the light. So here's what I believe God is telling you today. You are that warrior. God sees something in you. You are armed with a trumpet that is your voice. You're armed, you're earthen. You are the clay pot and you have this treasure inside of you, this bright light. But the clay pot needs to be broke, shattered just a little bit. And what happens when we submit and we allow God to crush us a little bit where we can trust him just like the wild horse. Number four, sometimes we need to be shattered a bit to reveal the light. And guess what? The enemy flees. Luke 8, 16. No one after lighting a lamp covers it up with a jar or puts it under a bed or a bushel, but puts it on a stand so that the, those who enter may see the light. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. The letter to Smyrna, be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. God knows that we live in a fallen world that is full of trials and suffering It's not fun sometimes. That place of suffering can be scary. There's a lot of unknowns. It's a mystery, but it's not necessarily the worst place to be. I think I'd rather be there than in a place of compromise and a place of of, um, fear of the world, fear of an unknown enemy. I'd rather be in a place where I just know that God knows that it hasn't occurred to him that something is happening. 
Again, the letter, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you'll be tested. You will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He was an ear. Let him hear. 1 Corinthians 2.9, but it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. I think of that lyric, that song, these afflictions eclipsed by glory. It's a mystery, but there is a glory somehow in your affliction. Let's bow and pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this Oh, this hard pill to swallow today, this message about suffering, that a part of it, it's easy to understand when it comes to the dark world and the sin in our own lives, the sin in people that are close to us, that the fallout affects us and, and we have tribulation because of it. Um, the, the, the tribulation or the suffering just because we are stubborn, Lord, help us to submit to you. To, it comes with trust. Help us to endure the pain of the night knowing that joy comes in the morning. Lord, we trust you. We know that you love us and you're in control of all things. I pray that our suffering would bolster, would be a leverage, would, would catapult our faith to new heights. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.